Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Lawrence Ray? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crimes, then offer my analysis. Lawrence Greco was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1959. He went by the name Larry. His mother divorced and married a man with the last name Ray. Therefore, Lawrence Greco became Lawrence Ray. Not much is known about his early life. In 1981, Larry served in the Air Force for 19 days. It's not clear why his tenure there was so limited. After this, Larry worked on Wall Street, which some people viewed as unusual because he did not have a college degree. Larry married a woman named Teresa and had a daughter named Talia. Larry liked to believe that he was important. He tried to build relationships with powerful people in New York City. In 1995, he befriended a police officer named Bernard Carrick, who later became the NYPD police commissioner. In 2000, Larry involved himself in securities fraud he had a number of ties to the Mafia and Wall Street brokers. Larry became a confidential informant against his conspirators, but then the government realized that he was part of the scheme. Larry was arrested and later pleaded guilty to securities fraud. He was sentenced to five years of probation. Larry accused his friend, Bernard Carrick, of corruption, and Bernard ended up going to prison for three years after pleading guilty to felony tax and false statement charges. Larry divorced in 2004 and had a bitter custody dispute. In 2007, he was sentenced to six months in jail for failing to turn over his daughter Talia to her mother, Teresa. After he was released, Larry was arrested for domestic violence, which violated his probation from the Wall Street scheme. Larry was arrested and sent to prison. When he was released in 2010, he moved into a dormitory at Sarah Lawrence College, where Talia went to school. He would often hang out in a common area in the dormitory. Talia introduced her father to her friends, saying that he was a man with powerful political adversaries who had targeted him unfairly and sent him to prison. For some reason, Larry was allowed to stay at the dormitory. The college never made him leave. Larry had a profound impact on four of the students who lived in the dormitory. Claudia Drury, Santos Rosario, Isabella Pollock, and Daniel Levin. The students looked up to Larry despite his recent release from prison and how it was unusual for someone of Larry's age to be living in the dormitory. The students viewed him as a source of wisdom. Larry was charismatic and friendly. Sometimes he would give them lectures. He represented himself as a life coach and claimed that he could improve their mental health. He said that he had worked for the FBI, the CIA, and the Marine Corps. He was a secret agent who recovered Stinger missiles off the black market and helped to orchestrate a ceasefire in Kosovo. He often elicited personal information from the students in the course of providing him his version of therapy. They were more than happy to share the information with him because they viewed him as a mentor or a guru. Larry would emphasize something he called the quest for potential, which was supposed to help the students overcome their insecurities. He became particularly close with Isabella. He would often sleep in her room, claiming that he was supervising her and helping her with emotional issues. When it came time for Isabella to visit her family for Christmas, Larry called her parents and told them that she was afraid of them and she would harm herself if she had to return home. Isabella stayed with Larry over the holidays. Larry had a friend named Lee Chen, who owned a one-bedroom apartment on 93rd Street in Manhattan. Lee was often away on business and allowed Larry to stay in his apartment. Larry moved several of the students from the college into the apartment. Larry, his daughter Talia, and Isabella were all sleeping in Lee's bed. Other students were sleeping in the living room. In January 2011, Larry and the students moved back to Sarah Lawrence College for the spring semester. By this time, the attitudes of the students had changed dramatically. Larry appeared to be 
in control of them. Parents complained about Larry living in the dormitory, but the college never kicked him out. By July 2011, Larry had moved back to Lee Chen's apartment in Manhattan. The students, who were now his followers in some type of cult, lived there as well. The one-bedroom apartment was pretty cramped. At night, Larry would run group therapy sessions, during which his followers would point out each other's flaws. Larry increased his level of control over his followers. He was able to cut them off from family and friends. In September 2011, when the students should have been heading back to the dormitory at Sarah Lawrence University, only Talia returned. The other students stayed with Larry in the apartment, and his efforts to manipulate them increased in intensity. Larry started becoming physically violent. He made a number of video recordings of his followers falsely confessing. Larry included himself in some of the recordings, which would come back to haunt him later on. He may not have been a good informant against the Wall Street conspirators, but Larry was an excellent informant against himself. Larry asked his followers to become more open sexually. He wanted them to have sex with each other and with him. He routinely humiliated them and asked them to humiliate each other. On one occasion, Larry made Daniel wear a dress as the other followers ridiculed him. Larry started this project where he forced the students to renovate the apartment. They had no idea what they were doing, and Larry didn't either. There were wires hanging from the ceiling and other serious problems with this renovation. Lee Chen decided that he had enough of Larry. In addition to this awful renovation, Larry never paid any rent. Lee told him to get out of the apartment. Larry refused and changed the locks. Lee filed a lawsuit against him, but it took over three years to get a judgment. During this time, Larry continued to live there. This is not exactly a great advertisement for New York City to attract landlords. What would that advertising campaign even look like? Come to New York City and buy property. You can rent it out, but you will never get paid. Bankruptcy is probably where you'll end up. Doesn't really seem like it's a very convincing way to attract people there. Later that same year, Larry talked on the phone with a sister of Santos Rosario named Felicia. She was a medical student in Los Angeles. The idea was that Larry was supposed to be helping Felicia meet her life goals, just as he was helping her brother Santos. After talking on the phone with Larry a few times, Felicia and Larry became romantically involved. Larry started giving her commands. For example, he told her to have sex with strangers in Los Angeles. She was uncomfortable with this, but eventually she did it. Larry further ordered that she record the encounters and send him the videos. She did this as well. Larry started telling Felicia that powerful people were out to get him, and this put her in danger. He made her install cameras in her residence. Eventually, in part due to feelings of paranoia, Felicia gave up her medical residency and moved to New York City to be with Larry. In addition to Felicia, Larry was also able to convince another sister of Santos to move into the apartment. So now three members of the Rosario family were there. In May 2013, Larry took a number of his followers to his stepfather's house in Pinehurst, North Carolina. He had them engage in physical labor, like digging ditches and yard work. He accused them of breaking the machinery, which of course they had no idea how to operate. Larry demanded that they pay him back for this broken machinery. He forced them to contact family and friends and get money, saying something like they were in big trouble because they owed Larry money for damaging the machinery. Larry made a lot of money running this scam. After moving back to New York City, Larry ordered Claudia to become a sex worker to repay the debt. She complied and worked for four years, during which she generated two and a half million dollars for Larry. During this time, Isabella tracked the money that Claudia made. She was almost like Larry's accountant. In 2015, Lee Chen was finally able to evict Larry from the apartment. Not long after this, the cult that Larry had formed started to break up. Both Daniel and Santos left. Larry moved the remaining members of his cult to Piscataway, New Jersey. The followers realized that they were in a desperate situation. Not only were they in a cult, they were living in New Jersey. 
In October 2018, Claudia told one of her clients about Larry's bad behavior, and the client helped her to escape the cult. The client did this by buying Claudia a train ticket. So she had earned millions of dollars over four years, but it was this train ticket that was able to set her free. In November of that same year, a story about Lawrence Ray was published in New York Magazine. The FBI read the story and started investigating. On February 11, 2020, they executed a search warrant for Larry's residence in New Jersey. They found a number of incriminating items, including emails, financial records, and videos. Larry was arrested and charged with 15 counts, including racketeering, tax evasion, extortion, money laundering, sex trafficking, and forced labor. The cult member, Isabella, was also charged with a number of offenses. She eventually pleaded guilty to a single count of money laundering. She is facing a maximum of five years in prison when she is sentenced in February of 2023. Larry went to trial and was found guilty on all counts. He is facing a maximum sentence of life in prison when he is sentenced in December of 2022. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts in a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Larry Ray was described as a very charismatic and convincing individual. When he was challenged in a conversation, he would use a variety of mechanisms like talking for 20 minutes straight or changing the subject. Lee Chen said that Larry could talk someone to death. Larry was so manipulative that mental health clinicians struggled to evaluate him during his custody dispute. They implied that Larry could defeat any clinician who was assigned to assess him because he was so charming. This might say more about the skill of the clinicians than it does about any skill that Larry has. Item number two, like many cult leaders, Larry projected a grandiose image. He bragged about having connections to government agencies and being sent on dangerous missions. Interestingly, Larry did actually have some connections to the government. He expanded on these to fabricate this image of being a secret agent action hero. Another important part of how Larry represented himself is the idea that the government was persecuting him. He was like a rogue agent who was exposing corruption and being chased by powerful figures who were out for revenge. Larry was able to use these lies to frighten his followers. He convinced them that they were in danger because of their association with him. Paranoia is commonly used by cult leaders to keep control. The idea is that the members are more afraid of the potential suffering outside of the cult than the real suffering inside of it. Larry studied notorious cult leaders. It seems clear that he intentionally selected tactics he believed would help him maintain control. Item number three. One major tactic Larry used was to convince the students that they were unworthy, damaged, and problematic. Larry's followers had a few things in common. Generally, they appeared to be sensitive, fragile, gullible, creative, agreeable, and looking for purpose in life. Some of his followers were depressed and had low self-esteem. Larry took advantage of this by pretending he was a mental health therapist and providing individual and group therapy sessions. He was always looking for their weaknesses, looking for a way to make them feel worse about themselves. Larry routinely offered terrible mental health advice to cult members and would diagnose them. For example, he diagnosed one of the members with schizophrenia. He was trying to convince his followers that they could not trust their own judgment. He wanted them to depend on him alone. He could save them from themselves. Item number four. A key tactic used by Larry was leveraging his followers against each other. During the nightly group therapy sessions, Larry would have the members focus on one follower, criticizing them harshly. Everything that the members talked about was considered a manifestation of childhood trauma. For example, breaking a plate or scratching a pan. Larry used anything and everything against them. Under the guise of revealing deep personal truths, he forced them to falsely confess. He was trying to collect material he could use to blackmail the students later. Larry wanted each member to feel as though they were hated by the rest of the members. They were the member who did not fit in with the cult. They were the troublemaker. In a sense, Larry wanted his followers to function differently as a group 
and they functioned individually. As a group, he demanded that they be sadistic and confident. As individuals, he made them feel weak and powerless. So they were only effective when they were aligned with his values. Item number five, Larry maintained total control of his followers when they lived with him. He would wake them up every morning playing music. Larry told them when they could eat. Sometimes he ordered followers to lose weight. He forced them to attend his therapy sessions. He told them when they could go to sleep. In some of the recordings that Larry made of his followers, they looked exhausted and disoriented. If someone is tired, hungry, and under stress, they are easier to manipulate. Larry ensured that his followers had no way to get support. He isolated them from family and friends. They had nowhere to turn, or at least that is what they believed. Item number six, what was Larry's motive? I think that Larry was motivated by at least three desires. He was clearly interested in money. He extracted millions of dollars from his followers. He wanted sex. He obtained it by saying that he was providing therapy or supervision. And Larry wanted to satisfy his sadism. He enjoyed making these college students suffer. Item number seven, what is the potential personality profile for Lawrence Ray? This is just a theory, my opinion. Larry appeared to be high in openness to experience. He was able to connect with people who were creative and intellectually curious. He was low in conscientiousness, although one could argue that he worked diligently to commit crimes. Larry was high in extroversion. He was outgoing, friendly, and sensation-seeking. He was also very talkative. He was low in agreeableness. Larry was not altruistic or modest. And he had mid-range neuroticism. On the low side, he was calm under pressure. And on the high side, he was angry and could not resist temptation. Larry appeared to have several characteristics of narcissism. He was grandiose, arrogant, vindictive, resentful, distrusting, self-centered, had a sense of entitlement, lacked empathy, and he desperately wanted to be admired. Larry also appeared to have psychopathic characteristics, like being manipulative, having superficial charm, and having no remorse. Item number eight, there is little question that Larry was a superior cult leader. He infiltrated a college dormitory and easily controlled relatively high-functioning and intelligent young people with good family support. He was able to exploit weaknesses and insecurity to obtain a phenomenal level of control. Larry did not have a lot going for him. He had spent some time in prison. He didn't start off with a lot of money. He was not physically attractive. He lived in New Jersey. There were a number of disadvantages present. He built his cult based on his charisma and his ability to deploy every single cult tactic ever invented. Larry managed to avoid the mistakes of many other notorious cult leaders. For example, he did not waste resources preparing for Armageddon, like Elizabeth Clare Prophet or David Koresh. He didn't claim to have past lives, like Amy Carlson. He did not overinvest in New Age nonsense, like Teal Swan, although he did get involved in some of that. Larry didn't think that he was receiving messages from UFOs, like Tony Alamo. And he didn't pretend to be a deity, like James Edward Baker or Alan John Miller. Larry was more similar to someone like Keith Raniere from the Nexium cult. Larry was a cult leader who had a chance of appearing normal and legitimate to outsiders. This disguise helped him to get away with his crimes for many years. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Lawrence Ray is a reminder to society that young people are vulnerable to manipulation and need to be protected. A person's insecurities can be leveraged against them with devastating results. It doesn't matter how well supported or how intelligent the young person is. Overconfidence and high self-esteem can be dangerous, but having no sense of self and being impressionable can be dangerous as well. Those are my thoughts in the case of Lawrence Ray. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.